Hey friends, and welcome to the World Transformed. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and tonight we're going to be talking about the mysterious universe. With me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. Happy Wednesday. How are you, my friend? Man, I'm doing great. Uh, eager to get into the secrets of the universe and all that. And that first story, uh, I've, I've been wondering about that comet for a while. So let's talk about it. Well, here we go. That comet that we didn't even know for sure what the heck was it was. It, was. Yeah, it showed, exactly. up in our, showed up in our solar system last year. Strange cigar-shaped object flies in from interstellar space, circles the sun, and flies out of the solar system again. Kind of a, or a loop, so I should say, once around the sun, and flies out of the solar system again. It was odd enough that there was some pretty serious speculation going on that it was a non-natural phenomenon, that it was a, I won't say man-made, but a alien-made craft, that, that this was actually not even just a rock, but perhaps something a little more sophisticated than that. And there was good reason to think that, because it was so strange. And it was also exciting, because it was the first time that we'd ever observed an interstellar object entering the solar system, plus bonus, leaving the solar system, right? So, so it was a, it was, it was a <laughs> it didn't, pretty... It didn't, slow, it didn't slow down and take you know, and decide to take over, so that's good. Literally, pretty, pretty interesting arc that it followed here. And it's only in, after the fact, looking at the data, looking at the observations that we had, that scientists are able to pretty conclusively now state this was a comet. So, meteor was interesting, spaceship was very interesting, comet was kind of the least interesting of all the possible explanations, and wouldn't you know it, once again it turns out we're not saying it's aliens because probably it wasn't aliens. Because it's probably not. Well, when we say some have even suggested it could have, it could have been an extraterrestrial craft, maybe we should own up to it, or at least I should. I'm the one, I'm one of the ones who suggested it was potentially an extraterrestrial craft because when we get used to seeing a, a comet, we, you have a certain idea of what they look like, right, uh, or an yeah. asteroid. Their, their aspect ratio it shouldn't be like uh, sixteen to one, right? And you know, like a cigar-shaped thing. And uh, right. And this was, and so that's it's that's odd. That plus uh, the fact that it was coming from extraterrestrial space, and we we knew that a outside the solar system. Uh, interstellar space is interstellar word. space is the word I was trying to use. Thank you, yep. thank you, Phil. You know, put all that together, and I went, wow, this could be something. Well, it's yeah, it is something. It's a comet. And, it's a uh, comet. Yeah, we, we, we got excited. We said, hey, could be something. Wasn't. Probably wasn't. Probably was a comet after all. So this one is just kind of the, this is what happens with a mysterious universe. Every now and then it becomes a little less mysterious. You know what we call that? We call it science. So yeah, we'll, yeah. Keep, we'll, we'll keep looking for the aliens. Turns out, turns out this one was not. But that's okay because we got some real mysteries here. Okay, we got some real mysteries here. This next one, the universe's rate of expansion is in dispute, and we may need new physics to solve it. And we're going to revisit that one with, uh, with the story that we're going to conclude with here. But this is pretty interesting stuff. What we're talking about here is called the, it's the, the, the rate of expansion, right? The number that tracks the rate of expansion is the Hubble constant. Right, the Hubble constant okay. is the is the number that says this is how fast the universe is expanding. So, what we've got is the Hubble constant is supposed to be about forty six thousand two hundred miles per hour per million light years, or they they give the abbreviation here sixty seven point four kilometers per second per MPC, whatever whatever an MPC is. So we've got we've got one set of readings looking at distant objects that give us that. But now we have new measurements on pulsating stars in local galaxies, and these are very very precise measurements that are giving us 50,400 miles per hour per million light years. So that's a big difference, okay? So we're looking at objects closer to us, and we're getting a faster expansion of the universe than looking at objects much farther away. That doesn't make any sense at all. Everything that we know would lead us to think maybe if you look farther out into the universe, you're going to see cosmic inflation at an earlier stage, and maybe it's going to look like it's going faster, right? 
Yeah, yeah. But no. We're seeing the faster speed closer and the slower speed farther away, which makes no sense according to anybody's model of how this whole thing is supposed to work. Let's imagine that uh, we have a balloon, and you put little dots all over this, uh, all over a balloon, and we are, one of, we are on one of those dots. Say our dot is our star, right? Yeah. And all, all, all around this balloon are uh, other stars far off. And uh, as you add air to the balloon, uh, that would be the universe expanding. And so the close stars are moving away from you. But the, the stars that are further away should be, um, according to the standard model, moving faster, really, or look, appear to be moving faster because the expansion of the plastic or whatever, right, the rubber balloon uh, is, is creating some space between you and, the, and a local dot but more space between you and a dot on the other side of the balloon, right? Right. But that's not what they're seeing. So that's... that's well, I, and I want, to, I want to clarify that we're not talking about the, the speed of objects, okay? This is... Yeah. Which, 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 is tr which I think still pans out okay. It's the rate of expansion, okay? So just... just uh, of, of space itself. Yes. Of space itself. So it's, it's a slightly yeah. different thing that's, that's being measured here. And I, I don't know that I don't know that things are moving at the wrong speed, but the universe itself seems to be expanding at the wrong rate, which that itself just makes you scratch your head based on exactly what you just said, right? You go, well, wait a minute. Yeah. If, if things are moving at the right speed, but the universe is expanding at the wrong rate, what does it all mean? Well, what it all potentially means is that it's one of two things, right? Either there's something amiss in our model where we have to go back and we have to we have to rethink some of the assumptions or we have to rethink some of the calculations that we're using. Or we've got another one of these situations where there's a missing ingredient. And just as we've had to pump dark matter and dark energy into our equations in order to make our standard model of the universe fix work, there might be a, new, a whole new dark something that has to be plugged in in order to make it work. And what's interesting about that to me is, if, assuming that piece turns out to be the case, Eventually, physics is going to be mostly about dark stuff, right? I mean, f physics is, is quickly turning into this patchwork of there's, there's a few things that we know about that we can look at that work, and everything else is just underpinned by, well, we, don't know, we don't know what's going on. It, it, it almost seems like the more we learn about physics, the more precisely we can say how little we know about physics. <laughs> we can say with precision how dumb we are. <laughs> how much we have yet um, to learn, Brad. Yeah, and that is that is correct. That, that's a better way of saying it. And yeah, like you said, our our, our last story might might uh, have a clue. And so stick around for that one. So might touch but, on that. But meanwhile, let's let's hit it here. We got a massive rogue planet with unexplained aurora, glow discovered drifting far beyond our solar system. So is this it? What what's it called? Tiamat, Diamat, the Velikovskian predicted huge, massive planet that's going to come rolling into our solar system one of these years and destroy everything? No, it is not, because it's very far away and it would never get here in, in, anywhere in our lifetimes. This is out here in interstellar space. This object has been discovered, and it's not a comet for sure. What is it? They're calling it a planet, but is it a planet? Well, it's 12 times the size of Jupiter. So. Right. That's big. That's awful big, big for a planet. Right. And a, a brown dwarf, though, is uh, thought to be bigger than that. But if it's got a glow, Phil, that, that tells me that it, it might be, there, there might be some fusion going on there, right? So here's the quote. This object is right at the boundary between a planet and a brown dwarf or failed star uh, and is giving us some surprises that uh, can potentially help us understand magnetic processes on both stars and planets as uh, the researcher here, Dr. Cal. So that is cool. It's interesting that it's sitting amongst a bunch of stars, and when they checked its age, it wasn't anywhere near the right age to be in the cluster of objects that it's in. So they look at it and they said, this thing is not a failed member of this group, which is what originally they thought it might be. So this is a brown dwarf. I, I don't know why we call that a failure. You know, 
it's yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's a, it's a different kind of star. Okay, why? why yeah, it's a, it it's, a star it's a star that's may, it might be on its way to getting bigger as it as it attracts more mass to itself, perhaps, and therefore becomes something else. Or maybe it just spends its lifetime being a brown dwarf. Uh, that's <laughs> why. Yeah. Why should we call it a failed star? Why make that uh, a failure? So it's a brown dwarf. Yeah. You know, yeah, the, the, exactly. the universe apparently needs brown dwarfs too. But but anyway, the the point is, it's not <laughs> that. It's not it's not a star that didn't ignite in this group anyway it's not part of this group it came from someplace else and because it hasn't hit the deuterium burning limit which is what they look for in terms of calling something a brown dwarf is a certain temperature they're calling it a planet they're saying it's right at the it's right at the boundary but it's a planet because there's no uh, deuterium burning going on that that we can identify where the glow is coming from that's the mystery I'm thinking it's Canto Bight, right? It's a huge casino planet. All the lights are on, and <laughs> it, it, it could be an interesting stop on our way to other places. Well, uh, it's a great it's a great mystery here. Is what is this thing? Is it a star? Is it a planet? If it's a planet, why is it glowing? If it's a star, why isn't it as hot as it needs to be? So it's just a wonderful. It, Little mystery sitting out there in space, and and uh, I suspect if we if we get the ability to study things uh, in inter- interstellar space, that that would be a good one to start with. It's uh, not so far away, that, you know. It's it's closer, and, and and it's interesting because it's hard to categorize. So and hard to categorize, about some and, pros. and and where to come from, right? That too. Yeah. It, it's as weird as the as the comet we talked about in the first story was. Right. And it's just wandering around the wandering around the universe, popping into a cluster of stars that it doesn't belong in. Is it going to stay there? Is it going to move out of there? How did how did how did it get in there? So it's just it's it's mysterious any way you want to any way you want to look at it. And perhaps even from where we are now, we can we can get more data and learn more about it. But it's an interesting class of object if it is in fact part of a new class, and we can only look forward to seeing more on this one and and perhaps on things like it. Okay, Stephen, take us home here now with the peculiar math that could underlie the laws of nature. Okay, I'm going to just sort of preface this by saying that this is so far beyond me that I just kind of want to introduce the audience to it. And if, if you find this interesting, I'll do my best. Smile. Okay, so we're going to talk about octonians, which looks like... That's right. It, which does not mean eight onions. It means something else. What is it? It means something here? else. Okay, so... Interesting numbers, basically, and let's let's you know we we you start with uh, the your familiar numbers that uh, you, you can find on a number line, you, you know one pi negative eighty three, whatever. That's mm-hmm. that's our that's our normal Regular real numbers. Numbers. Yep. That, then uh, you know in the sixteenth century, a mathematician uh, began uh, uh, fooling with numbers that work like coordinates on a two D plane, and those you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide too. Uh, these two D numbers. And then from from there, uh, the, you went uh, went on up to 4D quater onions, or it's not onions, but quater on, nonions or whatever. And that was discovered in 1843. And uh, lo and behold, that works with our math too. You can add, subtract, multiply, and divide those. Then that brings us eventually to 8D numbers. Those were discovered in 1898. And you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide those numbers as well, but that's where it stops, Phil. We cannot go beyond those numbers and still be able to use them in math. You can't uh, add, subtract, multiply a, a 16D number, for example. That doesn't, it just doesn't work. And I think that that is a clue. At least uh, this particular physicist, Cole Fernie, believes this is a clue to our own universe. So, so the idea is you can go up to non-nonians or whatever, decanonians or whatever, that those numbers right. can be they, they can be discovered or calculated or whatever. But when when you're dealing with them, normal mathematical operations that we rely on and that we use right. for all the other numbers just don't work. So does this say that, something about our universe? And what's interesting about that is, does it say we can only have eight dimensions in our universe? What does that do to string theory, which says we have ten dimensions, right? <laughs> Where's the math? To cover the other two dimensions, if 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 those normal operations don't work, yeah. Well, this is this is just the idlest of speculation for for us. Well, we are the speculist after all. That's what we're. That's that's, <laughs> that's what, we're what we do. Yeah, that's but right. but once again, this may not be pointing directly to 
the limits of our knowledge, but the fact that this might say something about the structure, underlying structure of the universe and we have no idea how to figure that out or whether it does, just again demonstrates how much we have yet to learn. And I guess, Stephen, that's why we're going to just keep doing but these podcasts. Right? So we gotta... <laughs> exactly. You know, that we do this as much for our own education as, uh, as for the audience. So uh, you know, that's just right. for our own edification, we're going to keep doing this, guys. <laughs> we're going to keep trying to pound away here at the Mysteries of the Universe, and we hope that some of you will join us as we continue to do that. Speaking of which, we will be back on Friday with a brand new show. We're going to be talking about some big surprises So hope you can all be with us then. Great talking with you, Stephen. Great having you all with us. And until next time, live to see it.